In this video, we'll be looking at transport in animals, which is the standard level part of B3.2. Now, first let's talk a little bit about how animal transport systems are organized. In humans, we have our heart, and our heart is going to pump blood away from the heart and two other regions of the body through these structures called arteries, okay? So arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart a for artery, A for away, and veins are going to return blood back to the heart. Now, both of those are very important for moving blood, but neither one is the spot where materials actually diffuse in or out of the blood or in or out of tissues. That's going to happen in these very teeny tiny blood vessels called capillaries, okay? So these capillaries are actually the site of exchange between the blood and the environment, and they are right here. So the way that these capillaries work is that this blood leaving the heart and going through the arteries is going to branch off into smaller and smaller blood vessels, first little arterioles, and then into these capillaries. And this is where materials are going to diffuse out of the blood and into tissues. Okay, so some of this, these like nutrients are going to diffuse out of the blood, and I'll get rid of this so that this isn't confusing anymore. Some of this is going to diffuse out of the capillaries and into the blood, and then that blood is going to pick up waste products from tissues, that waste is going to diffuse back into the capillaries and then through the venules into the veins and then back to the heart. Now, tissues that require a lot of oxygen or other nutrients are going to have a high capillary density, right? So when we think about like muscles in particular, they're going to need lots of oxygen, lots of glucose. They're going to need lots of capillaries here, okay? So if we want to be thinking diffusion, we want to be thinking a large surface area and having a lot of it, okay, so that we can get that diffusion process going as efficiently as possible. So let's add a little detail to this. So blood is going to be flowing through these arteries and then through these little arterioles. And when it reaches these capillaries, that's when we're going to get this fluid that comes out. And this fluid is going to have lots of great things in it, things like oxygen, water, glucose, all this good stuff that the tissues need. Okay, that tissue fluid is then going to flow between tissues and things are going to diffuse into the cells and tissues um, as they need it to. They're also going to be producing waste. Those tissues are going to be producing waste that needs to diffuse back into the capillaries. So this waste is going to go back into the capillaries and it's going to become part of the blood that is in that capillary network. And then that is going to flow through these venules, through these veins, and back to the heart, okay? So that blood by that time has made a complete circuit, okay? So here I just want to like note the difference between how this fluid works, okay, and how this waste works. So what is it that's great about the capillaries for getting this to happen? Well, what we'll notice here, if we were to zoom in on these capillaries, is that they would have pores. And these pores are going to help make this exchange of materials much more efficient. So again, theme B, all about form and function. If the function is to get things to diffuse in and out, we need that form to be amenable to that. Now, because they have different functions, the features or the structural components of arteries and veins are going to be a little bit different. We need to not only be able to describe these in words, but also point them out in pictures. So let's talk about these arteries first. They are responsible for getting that blood away from the heart they are going to have a very thick muscular wall, so we can kind of see that here, and they are going to have a relatively narrow lumen. So the lumen is a term for this like space inside of something, this hollow space. We'll see that in a lot of other structures as well. 
they are generally circular in shape, okay, and they maintain their shape relatively well. On the inside, this picture doesn't have it, but on the inside you may notice that they are a little bit bumpy or have some ridges, and that's called inner surface corrugation, okay, and it has to do with that muscle layer that's on the inside. And we are also going to find that in a microscope image, we will be able to see wall fibers. So in the arterial walls, we'll see lots of muscle tissue and we're gonna see collagen and all the things that are helpful in terms of getting that artery to be able to force blood away from the heart and towards the outer parts of the body. Veins, on the other hand, have a much different structure because they have a much different function they are going to have a thin wall. Now that thin wall is because it's, they don't have the ability to contract and push blood like the arteries do. The arteries can do that on their own. These veins rely on muscles, like skeletal muscles that surround the veins to squeeze and contract and push that blood back towards the heart. So in order for the veins to be able to be squeezed by that surrounding skeletal muscle, they need to have thin walls. Now, they are also going to have a much wider lumen. So you can see that here, that this space is much wider than in the arteries. That's in order to maintain low pressure so that that blood can be squeezed back towards the heart. They can sometimes be circular, but a lot of the times they're going to look like a flattened shape, okay? Like they've been squished. Again, that's the muscles squeezing them. We won't notice any inner surface corrugation because there's not much of a muscular wall here and we won't be able to see any of those collagen or muscular fibers in the wall. So let's see if we can find them in this micrograph. This is a skill that we need to be able to have. I'm going to look first for an artery. So I want to find something that has a thick wall and it's circular in shape and it's got this inner surface corrugation and that's right here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of try to highlight this artery. It's this whole structure right here. That's the artery. Okay, so again, what am I looking at here? This is a very thick wall. So this entire feature here is the wall. You can see it's it's got these ridges on the inside, that's that corrugation. It's got a circular lumen that's relatively narrow and in general it keeps its circular shape. Veins on the other hand are going to look very different. So I'm going to highlight the vein in the picture, I'm going to circle the vein in the picture and that's this structure right here, okay? So this vein has a very thin wall. So you can see that's much thinner than the wall of the artery and it's kind of been flattened. So it's probably a circle in shape, but it's being flattened by the surrounding muscular tissue and it's got a very wide lumen, okay? That's that space in the middle and I can't see any corrugation or fibers. Now, if we want to think about the features of arteries that make them very good at transporting blood away from the heart, we first need to think about what that might require. So this needs to be something that can carry blood at high pressure, right? So away from the heart, all the way to the extremities of your body. It needs to be able to contract on its own, okay, to force that blood. And then it also needs to be able to recoil, right, to expand back in between those heartbeats. It also needs to be elastic and strong, okay? So it needs to have all of these features in order to get that blood away from the heart. Well, what are the structural components that are going to be helpful there? Well, this narrow lumen, okay, this area right in here in the middle is going to be very good at helping to maintain that high pressure. Again, it's going through a relatively small area. This thick muscular wall that we're seeing on the outside here is going to allow that artery to both contract and recoil, right? So when the heart is, you know, beating, when that, when your ventricles of your heart are forcing blood through your arteries, there's lots of pressure. That blood is moving on its own. But when that heart is relaxed, we need the arteries themselves to contract to keep forcing that blood through those blood vessels. So that muscle wall is going to be very, very 
important. And then we also need it to be elastic and strong to be able to withstand all that pressure. And so that's when all of these collagen and elastic fibers that are in this wall here um, are going to be very helpful. Okay, so they're going to help maintain that arterial structure so that it doesn't burst under that high pressure so that it can recoil. Again, all of these functions um, require specially adapted features. So here's another way of organizing that. That narrow lumen helps to maintain that high pressure. Those thick fibrous walls can expand and contract without bursting. And those elastic fibers in there are really interesting because when they expand and then the pressure drops, it also recoils. So that's going to mean that I need less energy for a full contraction. And again, those muscles are going to help push that blood through. So again, form and function, very important here in transport. Now, because those arteries are expanding and contracting, we can actually um, feel them, and that's called our pulse. There are several areas on the body where you can take your pulse. One is right here, okay, on your neck, and then you can also take it on your wrist. I recommend trying to practice finding your pulses. You can also um, use what we're seeing here in this picture. This is a digital um, pulse reader, and I'm looking at the pulse right here. Now, pulse and heartbeat aren't the same thing. Your heartbeat is like your heart muscle contracting. When we say pulse, what we're feeling are, again, those arteries expanding and contracting. So they're not the same thing, but they do happen at the same time. So we can use those numbers interchangeably. So if I say my pulse rate, it will be the same as my heart rate. Now, let's think about this absurdly drawn <laughs> human here. This human has a heart right about here, okay? Now, we have this network of blood vessels that includes veins that extends to all reaches of our body. Let's say that there is blood um, in this person's leg, and this blood has to make its way back up to the heart. Well, it's going to do that through veins, but one of the interesting problems here that veins tend to have is that a lot of them are pushing blood against the force of gravity. So in order to bring blood back to the heart, that's going to require some special adaptations, especially because they're bringing that blood at relatively low pressure. So here I kind of have a cross section of a vein, right? Okay, and so this blood is going to be going this way back towards the heart. So what we're going to find here is a very thin wall and that wall needs to be thin because on either side of the vein, and I'll try to maybe draw it here and like here like this, on either side of that vein, we're going to be relying on skeletal muscle to kind of contract and squeeze that vein and squeeze the blood through the vein. So you can think of it like squeezing toothpaste through a tube. Now, what happens when those muscles relax? Well, then that blood is going to want to come back down this wrong way. And so one of the things that veins have in order to prevent that is they have these valves, okay? And so these valves can close um, and that is going to help prevent that backflow, okay? So these valves right here can close when the skeletal muscle relaxes to prevent blood from flowing the wrong way. And here's maybe a better view of these valves here, right? So as the skeletal muscle is squeezing, and we should maybe draw that in here, here's my skeletal muscle on either side of my veins. When they're squeezing, that's forcing the blood back through the heart. When they're relaxed, blood will want to go backwards, but these valves can close to prevent that backflow of blood. So those really important features here, again, a wide lumen is going to make it easier for the muscles to squeeze them. Um, and that's because a wider lumen will cause that blood to be at a much lower pressure than in those arteries. Okay, um, again, that thin muscular wall, it's very thin, so the muscles don't meet a lot of resistance when squeezing there. And those valves are there to prevent backflow of blood. 
So in general, arteries carry blood away from the heart. So here's the heart, and here's this really awesome artery right here called the aorta. So blood is going to leave the heart, travel through the aorta, and then all across the regions of your body. Branching off of the aorta are these special blood vessels called coronary arteries. And I'll kind of try to use green here. These coronary arteries carry this blood from the aorta directly to the heart tissue itself, and they carry lots of oxygenated blood full of glucose. That heart muscle is working really hard, so we need this like constant oxygen-rich blood supply. Now, some bad things can happen if those get occluded. Occluded is just a fancy way to say blocked, okay? So if those coronary arteries, and that's just blown up here in green, so if I look at one of these in greater detail, it looks like this. If you have a blockage here that prevents blood from getting to this heart tissue, that can be very bad. And that's called CHD, coronary heart disease. So there's um, a few different things that can block them, but it could um, start with a narrowing, really. And that narrowing can be caused by a buildup of what we call plaque. So this plaque is kind of like a collection of like cholesterol and maybe some other lipids. And when it narrows that coronary artery, it can cause a blockage. And then we get something called a myocardial infarction, also known as a heart attack. And so basically what's happening is that if this is blocked, you are preventing this heart muscle here from getting the oxygen and nutrients that it needs and it starts to die. So there are some risk factors here with CHD, um, smoking, obesity, not having enough exercise, certain genetic um, traits can lead to increased risk of myocardial infarction, high blood pressure, which is also known as hypertension, poor diet and age. All of these can be risk factors for um, causing blockages of these coronary arteries. And again, if we're understanding form and function, the function is for them to bring oxygenated blood to the heart. We really need them to be able to do that. So that's why we need them to remain open um, and not blocked and if we have any of these risk factors, it's really important that we keep an eye on our heart health.